Welcome back. It seems we always have a new thing to look at, and this uh, day is no exception. So, yeah, this might not be necessarily chess related, but hey, technology's fun, and we're glad to hear and learn from other people's experiences, even in domains we're not completely familiar with. I don't know, because learning's fun, and it's fun to teach people. So, with that said, let's take a look at this article by Cesar del Solar, Maker of Things. Uh, one of the developers on uh, the Woogles.io team who uh, developed a word game site so we can play uh, tiles onto a colored board and score points based on which tiles you play and your opponents can challenge off your plays if they're not in the dictionary. So let's take a look at this. Profiling a Go language production server. A few months ago, I noticed that my open source crossword board game website Woogles was having CPU spikes while running tournaments. Specifically, at the beginning of every tournament round, CPU would spike a bit in ECS. Memory would also spike, although not as dramatically. And the image below shows an example. Note the periodicity, roughly every 30 minutes, which is around the cadence of most of our tournament rounds. So, before going too far, I did offer a bit of a forward, but let me try to parse this for us as we go, shall we? So, Woogles, again, the crossword board game website. Uh, it's free software, not just open source, but source is available as well as you have a license under which you can modify it, execute it, redistribute it. So this is considered not just open source, but also free software. Um, and yeah, he provides, here's the story under which certain conditions occur. This uh, image is captured by a profiling tool. I don't recall to what extent I've shared graphical profiling tools, but if you search uh, YouTube, uh, what was the gentleman's name? There's, uh, goodness, there's a gentleman who, Brian Cantrell, that's it, who's given multiple presentations, um, at least some of which have these flame graphs that show resource utilization, that show latency, uh, I.O., and so forth. And he stresses the importance of being able to visualize data because the human eye is fantastic at picking this sort of stuff out, finding patterns in data. Um, so it's important to have a good visualization this way as opposed to just a plain text log that's really difficult to parse. So, yeah, this cadence of a half hour just jumps out at the human eye in a way that a plain text log might not. Uh, ECS, I assume, refers to an Amazon Cloud instance. Um, I think, well, years ago I did have a little bit of learning about uh, just an introduction to hosting things in the cloud, and I believe that uh, these services are hosted up there so that they're scalable and uh, there's not so much of a need for developers to also be proficient sysadmins. They just have to figure out how to troubleshoot things through Amazon's dashboard and services and such, which might not be easy. So in cases where it might not be feasible to troubleshoot things up in the cloud, developers can attempt to replicate things locally, but that could be time consuming. So yeah, to whatever extent the tools are available, try to make use of them, I suppose. Or I'm not sure how this was captured, but anyway, let's go on. Eep, this isn't good, having this periodic CPU spike, right? Well, I'm not sure. It's cause for some concern because it's not well understood. But um, I'm not immediately convinced that a CPU spike is necessarily a terrible thing. It is if you're observing other issues. It is also if you don't expect this to occur. So there should ideally, in a perfect world, you'd have some expectations of, hey, I tested this before putting it in the cloud. Here's the asymptotic behavior I'm familiar with. But 
you know, with, uh, it's difficult to do such rigorous testing um, on every little thing that you do, especially when you have a website that's evolving as quickly as Google's is evolving. So yeah, the CPU spike, I guess at first glance, yeah, it's a cause for some concern, but is it good? Is it bad? We don't know yet. We have a fear of the unknown, and it's worthy of further exploration, but um, yeah, I don't know. Hard to say, right? Anyway, let's, I guess, lead with the assumption that CPU spikes could be a bad thing. Um, so, these spikes were not as dramatic when he first noticed them several months ago, so he logged it as another issue to fix at that time. <laughs> yes, they are a registered nonprofit who are trying to make competitive word games accessible to everyone. So yeah, feel free to help these guys out. Uh, you can find their source code on GitHub. So uh, yeah, congratulations to the Woogles team for releasing such a excellent offering and doing so with free software. Um, so I'm very interested in just constantly reminding people that the site exists, just on the basis that it's free alone. That, you know, suppose five years, ten years, some number of years down the line, something goes wrong with the site, something goes wrong with the team, whatever, you have the liberty to use that same license and develop a new and better site, or use that license and just look at the code, look at the ideas, the commit history, everything that's written about it, and you can look at all the internals of the site, figure out how to secure it better, figure out if you'd prefer to write it in your own language of choice, libraries of choice, and so forth. So, yeah, free software, I think, is quite uh, encouraging for contribution. My own contributions have been limited so far. I've had some challenges, but that's on my end. Uh, anyway, so CPU spikes, the database is also not doing too great. Okay, and at this point, you, I start to get a bit more concerned as I hear more information that would suggest, you know, there's just not just a bug that we're going to put in our backlog, but we're going to take, you need to take a closer look at this. Um, I don't know, I can't actually zoom this. Uh, can I zoom in like this? Yeah, let's try this. Maybe this is a better way to read the article as a whole as well. You can see the CPU spike, the status check failed. So this is, a assume, a periodic ping, and like I don't see any failures over here just yet. Uh, the network traffic invites. So network traffic grows and grows and grows and spikes up there and then goes back down. And the network out invites. Well, I assume if you've just done a whole bunch of tournament pairings, there is some information to communicate out, but I don't know the scale of the graph. So there's still a lot that I'd have to understand to really get a better appreciation of this. Um, disk reads, invites, not shown here. But yeah, we're told that it's the database, not necessarily the disk, that's encountering an issue here. Network out shows hundreds of megabytes being transferred via the network. Okay, so yeah, I didn't appreciate the scale of the graph, but hundreds of megabytes is what we're talking about here. That's like multiple times the entire collected works of uh, William Shakespeare. That's tons and tons of information uh, for a text-based game. Um, so how is it possible that so much data is emitted? Um, our tournament representation could admittedly be more efficient than it currently is. But these aren't massive tournaments. He's saying on average they'd be 20 to 30 players. But he's even seen spikes for a small eight-person tournament. Again, it, it's difficult being in a nonprofit space. It's fantastic that they can develop a website, uh, Woogles, and uh, it's free software. It's freely accessible to every user of the site. They haven't riddled it with ads. So yeah, it's quite impressive that um, given such resources that so much could be done, that they've released puzzles, they've released a tournament mode, they've released so much more um, in terms of like having dictionaries in multiple languages, being able to see definitions, 
being able to play a variety of different time controls and play a variety of AI opponents. It, that pace of development is quite extraordinary, honestly. So it's impressive that while all that's going on, um, yeah, that there haven't been tons of issues like this, but when they do crop up, they catch your attention and more and more, and eventually at some point you have to deal with it. Uh, so, okay, this is where we're going in the story. Things came to a head when during a 60 or so person tournament, the server straight up restarted a few times at the beginning of rounds. It looks like the ECS had out of memory killed the service. At this point, the issue became top priority and we resolved to fix it. We were in the middle of creating a new feature, puzzle mode. So task fell to him to rewrite what he thought was the bottleneck in the tournament mode. Tournaments are largely represented by JSON binary blobs in a Postgres database. And when a round starts, every player gets a ready widget that they can click on to start the game. When they click this button, the ready state gets written and saved to the JSON B blob. His theory was that, uh, I guess theory, hypothesis, whatever you want to say, theory might be best, but um, that this was very inefficient and killing memory usage. Actually, yeah, theory is more accurate than hypothesis here. Hypothesis presumes that you're going to conduct an experiment to test it before just going out trying to fix the thing based on your own uh, knowledge. Um, so his theory is that this binary representation was very inefficient and somehow killing memory usage, particularly if people refresh and uh, then as a function of refreshing become unready after having clicked the ready button and then rewriting the state of unready, etc. So uh, Sasar quickly came up with a design and started rewriting this part of the app so that ready states don't get written to the blob anymore. However, when he first wrote written an integration test simulating 200 tournament pairings that I'll click set ready nearly simultaneously and profiled it locally. So here's how he ran this running. Let me think about what this means. Test large tournament profile, I believe is the class name being executed, dumping the memory profile to a file mem.out, dumping the CPU file profile to cpu.out using Google Go language framework um, and its built-in test capability with running this particular test is how we read this command, I believe. Um, so he just demonstrates, here's what he ran. If you want to know more, feel free to search. Google has a good search engine. You could learn more about this. Um, so doing this test and trying to check 200 tournament players clicking ready simultaneously, he wanted to make sure the issue was what he actually thought the issue was, but something didn't quite seem right, especially with the fact that the DB bandwidth was so high during these tournament start rounds. Also, why now was this happening? We'd had 90 plus people tournaments in the past and had not noticed these spikes. Honestly, this is what, yeah, this particular last fact, like, they have had successful tournaments on Woogles. Uh, yeah, with 90 plus participants all at the same time. Um, so, yeah, it's surprising when something starts happening and you don't remember having made some massive change recently. You start to question, well, okay, how is this possible, this thing that had not happened before? And uh, in some cases, you have the luxury of being able to take your code and step it back piece by piece. Um, in some other cases, you don't have that capability of being able to do like alpha and beta and such uh, deployments. You just have one deployment, and that's the best you can do. It's... I mean, what do you do? How do you work around this sort of thing? It's kind of the purpose of reading this article is to see what options there are. So this profile run simulating 200 tournament players was somewhat inconclusive. The easiest way to visualize these profiles was to go 
tool pprof cpu out. For example, typing in png in the command line. Um, let me think. I don't know these tools, but again, I could search Google to get a better understanding of them. Um, but yeah, if this is a visualization of the call graph, I know what a call graph is. A call graph is a structure of, um, oh goodness. When you have a programming language and it goes instruction by instruction, and one of the instructions says call this other function, and then that other function has a series of instructions, and one of those says call another function, um, there's a name for this, I think it's called structured programming. So a call graph visualizes not just for a single thread, but for every thread that's executing, where is the instruction pointer within every context, within every function. And so this shows the call graph. If you're having 200 people click ready nearly simultaneously, you can see like where the code is being executed. Um, so let me check. Let me check. Is he doing what I think he's doing? So he's reporting, first of all, this uh, came to a head during this large tournament. And so it became important to address the issue. And he came up with a theory about what might be causing the issue. And let me just see if the way he wrote this, I think he's writing what I think he's writing, but let me check. So he quickly came up with the design and started rewriting part of the app. However, first uh, he wrote an integration test. Okay, so I don't know exactly how best to parse this. Sometimes a developer in a panic or support person in panic might come up with, hey, let me go try rewriting this thing. I think I can rewrite this and deploy this. And then they might take a step back and realize, wait, can I somehow verify the truth of my own theory before I go into this challenging rewrite that might mask the issue until it resurfaces again? Um, so I, I think as a best practice, if it's feasible, it's not always feasible, but if it's feasible, integration tests, system tests, load tests and such that are easy to write that are, um, I don't know, not extremely expensive to run. If there are ways to do these things feasibly with software, I emphasize the soft there, and we'll get there in a second, but if there's ways that are feasible to do that, it's kind of a good idea to enrich your own understanding of an issue before trying to release a patch. Sometimes you don't have that luxury, but... Um, with software the idea is that you know the product being developed the application the service the server all these things are soft that they are malleable that it's possible to combine them in various ways and to take them apart and test individual pieces of them in units and to test the integrations between the units and to test the system as a whole and that sometimes you have to do things creatively if you're just trying to test particular aspects of that system. Um, but yeah, what does this mean? Uh, so yeah, if it's possible to do such testing to verify your own theory before doing something that might introduce extra variables into the equation, if it's feasible, if it doesn't cost you your sanity, if it doesn't cost you more resources than you can afford, it can be a good practice to do this. Um, ideally, in a perfect world, the production system would capture enough information that you would just know what the issue is. But, you know, that's ideal. That's not always feasible or realistic. So sometimes you're having to try to cobble together your own tests to try to test a theory. Um, so yeah, when he said the word theory up here, I took issue with thinking that perhaps, as some do, you just take your theory as gospel and try this solution you have in mind, 
and if the solution seems to work, you're happy because this is the best you know how to do. Um, some people use a theory that way. Some people use a theory as a hypothesis, as he seems to be using here, where he's just doing a quick test to see, like, well, okay, this tournament had 60 people in it. What if I had 200 people in a tournament, and I can do this locally? And if he has this test ready to run, um, yeah, it's curious to do. So, and, like, it was surprising to have the spikes, so, you know, I could understand why this particular issue, whatever it was, got backlogged and not immediately addressed. Uh, but yeah, it's good to enrich your understanding. Um, I, <laughs> I guess I tend to fall on the side that if I don't understand something, I tend to be concerned about it. So... Yeah, in a perfect world, it would have been great to have something like this in the CI stack in the first place after the issue is filed. Whether or not there's time to analyze it and completely probe this, just setting a benchmark out there for uh, things wouldn't hurt. But every little test you run and write takes resources to figure out how to run, write, and maintain. So I get it. Uh, anyway... Uh, the profile here says it was somewhat inconclusive. You can see the call graph, including allocations uh, of memory, I assume. You can see that with 200 tournament players, he's allocating about 150 megabytes. Not a trivial amount, but if you have 2 gigabytes of memory, and uh, let's see, if you have 2 gigabytes of memory for this particular process, and if you have such an enormous tournament that you have 200 players, you know, it didn't seem right that, like, for a 60-player tournament, the system would be in jeopardy. Um, their actual tournament wasn't as large as 200, and people weren't all clicking ready simultaneously, so this wasn't exactly the thing that was happening in reality. So how is it that this 150 megabytes ended up being a concern? Okay, so he can't really replicate this locally, so he uh, had to figure out how to profile in production. And let's go back into the subject here. So profiling a Go language production server is the lesson that we're learning about, just for those who don't remember the title here. Go does let you profile directly on the production server with the right paths. If you import this module at the top of your file, a server will automatically be registered for you. Since uh, he was already using an HTTP server, he added these paths manually. Uh, let me think about this. So he's saying he doesn't need to register a new HTTP server, but one will be allocated for him anyway. Oh, I'm sorry, if you import this, um, you'd get a new server automatically. In this case, he didn't need to do that, apparently. All he needed to... Well, okay, he's got a new server here anyway. Whatever. I don't know all the... De well, this is a multiplexer for the server. Fine. So, yeah, he doesn't need a new server per se, but he's able to take this router and route new paths on it for debugging. Um, let me try this. Try to understand this. Um, okay, so if somebody calls this URL, the serve mux will take this URL and have this handler handle the request. If somebody calls this URL, the handler handles this request, and so forth. Um, so these all can generate certain data, I suppose, and return that through an HTTP response. That's kind of cool. So I see a heap handler, a go routine, I guess, to see like how things are hand going in concurrency. A stack trace? I, wait, no, that can't be a stack trace. It's some other kind of trace. Um, and an index and a profile. Not sure what all these mean. Oh, and then make sure your write timeout is set to something fairly large. Or you might, upon calling this, you, your request might time out, you might never get the response back. So 
yeah, you need a large write timeout and a large read timeout. Okay, fine, I get that. Uh, so you can run fairly long profile. Okay, I guess that makes sense too. The profile doesn't run forever, but I guess it could be a data stream for all I know. You start this. Um, this assumes your profile is listening on this particular port. Make sure to not expose this outside of your host. Okay, yeah. Be careful about this. You can then explore the top functions, for example. I see. So yeah, if your process is up in the cloud, yeah, if you just want to see top. Oh, top functions. I'm sorry, this isn't a top command. These are the functions that um, utilize the most memory and so forth. Uh, I don't know how to read this necessarily. Nothing too out of the ordinary says here, but it's good to have a baseline before the contentious use case. You can also get a heap profile. You figured the CPU profile would help here as the problem started by manifesting itself with CPU spikes mainly. That's interesting. <laughs> I don't know how you get this particular insight other than you look at the graphs and perhaps there's some nuance in the graphs and you can see temporal causality where the CPU spikes and then other things start spiking afterward. And I think that's maybe what he's referring to here. Okay, there's multiple tourneys per week run by the club directors wanting to run competitions for their club members during the pandemic. And as he was puzzling over this problem, he noticed a tournament that had been running for Madison, Wisconsin. So he contacted the director and asked if she could please send a message right before she starts the next round. And he collected some more baselines in the meantime. She happily obliged, collected another profile as the round was starting. I see. So profile here refers to CPU, memory, other statistics, uh, that kind of a profile. Um, as opposed to some sort of way of saying, I want to filter data that I get back. Now, this is actually the CPU, memory, etc. profile for resources. Um, then you collected a couple more at the end. And although each profile only contains a sample of all calls, if he or she, he should be able to see something. The server stops 100 times per second to collect information about what's executing. So this is how profiling occurs. So it's not necessarily super resource friendly. Let me think about that. I mean, it depends how efficient uh, the Go framework is at collecting this sort of information. It looks like a lot of information is being collected. You have like, what are these numbers? Uh, uh, what are these numbers? Yeah, I mean, these are cumulative numbers, some percent, and a flat number. Um, I, hmm. Beats me. Perhaps flat just refers to within the context of a particular function being executed. How many, t uh, how much time is spent within this function, but not calling other functions from it. I'm not sure completely how to read this, but maybe we'll get some explanation later. Again, certainly Google has a great search engine. Certainly if you just interface with the tool, it'll become more and more obvious what's going on. And hopefully there's better documentation for Go than there are for other projects, but I don't know. Anyway, um, ignoring the details for now. Um, so he says it's not necessarily super resource friendly. Again, depends how long it takes to collect whatever quality of information you're collecting, I guess. Um, examining the profile as you started the next round, expected to see some heavy JSON parsing centered mainly around the tournament module. And he did see his heavy JSON parsing from an unexpected source. Okay, let's see. Encoding JSON decode state skip is the number one thing in this top list um, for cumulative 20%. 
And again, I don't know how many people were in this particular tournament. I'm guessing it was not 60 players, because we uh, the numbers would be different, I assume. So this decode state skip. I'm not sure what the skip is for, but... Um, then there's some JSON validation going on, and other stuff. Oh, here we have a little graph, um, a call graph, even. Okay. So... Uh, we can see a function is calling other functions. Let's get uh, the box at the top. is called get rematch streak here. Okay. In Woogles, wherever a new game, whenever a new game starts, a function get rematch streak is called that gets the streak for two players. For example, player one has beaten player two ten times in a row. It is used to render a widget that looks like this here. Huh. <laughs> oh, I have some idea where this is going. Oh, now I feel guilty. Because, um, uh, yeah, this UI design might be just, um, inspired by other sites that I've seen. One of which had a performance issue generating such a thing. Um, it, sure, there wasn't Postgres involved. It wasn't a relational database. But uh, now I feel guilty for, like, if I had just looked at the issue list and maybe somehow kept better tabs on the development of this, maybe it could have occurred to me that this particular feature uh, is something that is more complex than it looks and vexed... Um, developers of a different site. Um, so, anyway. Yeah, it's used to tell people watching the previous game that a new round has started. Well, I'm sorry, it's also used for that purpose. There are more efficient ways of doing the latter task, but chalk this up to tech debt. They're not fixed yet. However, tournament games don't have rematch streaks. There is an ID the code uses to find a rematch streak it's the request ID of the game, but tournament games do not generate request IDs. There's an ID, the code, the code. This is to find a rematch streak. There's something I'm not completely grasping here. Um, I understand a tournament game wouldn't have a rematch streak because you're getting paired with a different opponent. Uh, Rematch pairings are uncommon. In a Swiss format, they'd be forbidden. I don't know in the Woogles tournament format if they would occur or not. But um, but anyway, I assume what he's going to say next has something to do with this dot skip here and this notion that uh, there is a request ID of the game. Um, but a tournament game doesn't generate a request ID, so there would be a skip going on. Let's see. Furthermore, the code to obtain the rematch streak looks like this. That's code. Uh, shall I take a stab at reading this, just for the fun of it? Okay, that looks like a function name. Okay, mission accomplished. We read it. Uh, this looks like the function keyword. Uh, I assume this s star db store is the return type of the function, and the parameters of the function are first of all this, and second of all this as a combination. Um, let me think what this means. I mean, these might be implicit parameters and explicit parameters. I don't really know. Uh, I've seen this similar writing, I think, in Scala. I could be very much off with that. But the notion that I could have a parameter list and another parameter list that are for the same function could be of some interest. Um, the word currying comes to mind, but might be completely inappropriate. I'm not sure. 
So anyway, there's a context, uh, the context of the web request, I assume, and an original request ID, not of like nullable string or something. And I don't know if Go has a concept of a nullable entity or nullable reference. Um, oh, okay, wait a second. Wait a second. So this gets or streak info response and error. Let me think about this. I mean, he's going to explain this in a minute. I just want to test my own parsing of this code first. Um, because I mean, I'd, I'd be inclined to think that error would be part of the return type, not necessarily a parameter. If you have a function that's called get rematch streak, then like this response pointer again would seem much more to associate itself with a return than some sort of input parameter. Um, yeah, so I'm a bit lost on the semantics of the function declaration. Here, this I assume allocates an empty array of data type or class game and the database context is s is this a instance scope reference or something that we're able to get out of this instance this uh, class object uh, i again i don't know semantics of how you would call things and go but if this is in a particular piece of code that corresponds to a class, I guess we're saying this S is implicitly available from the this reference. And so we can get the context uh, relevant database with, re with respect to this particular context through the S DB store pointer. That's, um, available somehow. Uh, so we get the database and then do some stuff. If the results are assign equal to database dot where etc and the game has uh, game end reason is not one of these prepared statement values um, none aborted or canceled um so let's see for quick data something o is equal to original request id i guess this is the o attribute of a json b object um and etc cetera, etc cetera, where the game is not non or aborted or canceled you want to be well uh isn't there another state S huh not in has me nervous but okay because like if you're trying to get the rematch streak wouldn't you want to know like completed games as opposed to not cancelled not aborted not none but maybe original games didn't have these values filled in maybe and then take whatever you found here uh, order it by created at descending and so forth. Um, now, arguably, one thing you could try at discovering this kind of thing, if I don't know, if you have some ability to replicate this all locally, would be uh, just short circuit all of this in production until you've had enough time or triage this in production. Don't get the rematch streak, just get something empty, and then worry about the details of the best possible fix later. That's one option, but you might not have enough information to replicate this incident locally, so fine. Um, the response thereafter... Wait. Oh, I'm sorry. So if, if things are found, um, dot find based on the game... Yeah, put the use the game array that got allocated and if you've done this search and you've found something that's not nil 
What is this return nil? Oh, the game's object is available, I assume, to the calling context at this point somehow. I don't know particularly how. Oh, I'm sorry. No, this is if after having executed this, the results error exists. Rather than returning the game object as well as the error, just return the error and discard the game array. But otherwise, you still have this game array that's populated, or maybe not populated if there were no previous games. Generate a streak info response object from that. If the number of rows affected by the result, result being assigned, I see results up here. Where is result defined? Just for my own understanding. I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't overly concern myself with it. Maybe it's some implicit. I'd like to understand, but I don't seem to have the luxury of that here. Anyway, so if row is affected is negative, or sorry, less than or equal to zero, so it's not negative, it's nothing if no rows had been affected or less than zero rows had been affected then we return this response of the streak info here um yeah i don't get that um maybe this caches things somehow uh what do i know for the index comma g in games, unmarshal metadata and so forth, and build up the response object, I'm assuming. Um, okay. So since there is no original request ID, this function is getting called with an empty string and then for pulling data for all previous tournament games. Is that how I read this? So there is no original request ID. I see original request ID is the first parameter here. We're saying where quick data O is equal to empty string. Um, this function is getting called with an empty string, therefore pulling for all previous tournament games, which also have an empty string as original request ID. Um, how do I understand this? How do I resolve that the Postgres does it this way? Well, now yeah, it's searching in the database where quick data O is an empty string. And it happens that for all previous tournament games, um, which have an empty string as the original request ID. What's a request ID? What is a request ID? I don't know. Uh, I f let's see, there's an ID in the code used to find a rematch streak. Um, I mean, the source code's all available on GitHub. I could dive deeper. I just prefer to stick with the article if I could. Um, but yeah, this underscores a weakness of the test. And is correct insight that if he changed one thing on his local, uh, local copy of the site and isn't seeing uh, the performance increase or even any indication that like something's happening on his side then there's some weakness in his test environment and that weakness is that he doesn't have the same quality of data available to him that's available in production and it can be difficult to get an accurate representation of production locally for sure um so yeah he's advising that this empty string matches lots and lots of records somehow for all previous tournament games, which have an empty string as an original request ID. 
Uh, so anytime any tournament game started, the code was pulling 15,000 tournament games out of the database. Note that all columns are being selected, even though only a few columns are required. All 15,000 tournament games are sent across the wire to a function that generates a giant slice, parses the JSON blobs, and so forth. Um, okay, so it's not so much about people clicking the ready button, but imagine what happens when people, when 30 plus tournament games, all start in rapid succession. Bugs easy to fix. Don't call the function if original request ID is blank. He additionally optimized the query a little bit to send less data. So when he says don't call the function, I believe he's referring to this here, this part, or even the whole function. Like, arguably, if original request ID is blank, don't call get rematch string, because you're just going to get back an empty result anyway. Um, so, yeah, there's been an argument that the data value or type of null in various languages has been a billion dollar mistake. It claims another victim today, you know, it's, how do you deal with that? Um, there's just so many different ways to accidentally write something that either is nil or null or semantically equivalent. And it's very difficult to catch such things unless you are just religious about never using anything that even approaches null. And it's difficult to like write any serious application in such an extremely disciplined manner. Perhaps Rust might force you to do such a thing. Apparently Go does not. I don't know. But like empty string exists in many languages, right? I don't know if Rust would prevent you from writing something similar. I know there is a keyword in Rust, unsafe, you can use to do all sorts of fun stuff, but um, yeah, anyway. Uh, the bug itself is easy to fix once you're aware of it. Yeah, a little caveat here. Yeah, the, once you are aware of the thing, then yes, it becomes easy to fix. Also, my original suggestion that we generated as I was going through this article, I've not read it before, was adding something in the CI pipeline to help detect this sort of thing. My suggestion um, would not have helped in this particular case unless the CI pipeline had a reasonable representation, or uh, not that, a reasonable subset of data from production or something that was production-like it wouldn't really be easy to replicate this. So one advantage of having this in the pipeline is you would see, okay, at least we know under some conditions this code works. This code has always worked. It's not just our experience of how this has worked in production in the past that we're relying on, but we actually have some other knowledge that on a very, very, very regular basis with every commit, with every night, with every hour, with every minute, however you want to write it, but you could like reliably execute a test and see that no this is exactly the same performance today as it was yesterday as it was five days ago as it was three months ago and so forth you'd have a lot more confidence going into this saying okay i know certain things um uh, and you could try if you have uh, again the motivation to do this Try varying certain variables, change the amount of memory that's available, add more sleeps just arbitrarily in the code. I'm trying to remember that chaos engineering is the term they use for this, where you just randomly throw wrenches into your CI or into some system that's specifically designed for this purpose, just to see like if you disturb the system, are there any patterns whatsoever as a result of that disturbance? Um, so you would have had a very high sense of confidence going into this, not just based on tournaments that run so many times per day, but tournaments that run on a much, much more frequent basis in your CI pipeline. But it costs resources and time and energy to maintain all these things, and maybe it's not worth it, because that wouldn't have exposed the error right away. 
you really would need to learn how to profile this in production or come up with a way to replicate it outside, which sounds pretty intense. So, yeah. Um, some lesson number one, check my assumptions. He was about to do a complicated refactor and would still have had the same issue. I have been there and eventually, hopefully you'll learn not to do this so much. Sometimes checking your assumptions can be too costly and you need to try things. Um, it sucks being in that kind of position. But if there's a complicated refactor that's about to be considered and there's a test you can do to somehow validate your assumption and it, it, if it's not it very, very intensely costly to do that validation, it might be worth doing that validation in many, many cases. Pay more attention to diagnostics already collected. The fact that database server was sending so much data and the problem was getting worse over time should have indicated that it had to do with the growing database. It can be difficult to do this though, honestly, depending on, okay, yes, you've collected the data, but what brings it to your attention? How do you visualize the data? It's hard. Um, try to run tests on systems that simulate production environments yeah, I, I feel for you, though. Um, he loaded a production database dump onto his test machine. He should have been able to replicate it. But, you know, you never know in advance exactly what the issue is going to be. So maybe it's the database. Maybe it's something about the network configuration. Maybe it's uh, a DDoS protection measure. So there could be a lot of things that factor into this. So, yeah, there... You'd like to have this, and yeah, I feel with them, but like this is rather difficult to do. Um, but let's see. Read the code. It's possible to find this bug without profiling, but admittedly, this is a complex project with a large coded uh, code base. I would go one step further here. Um, yes, reading of code is great. It's a complex project. It's very rapidly evolving. It's a, it's a very difficult thing to glue all these pieces of code together and completely understand every one of them as you're developing so many different things. Uh, and if this is not like your primary project, uh, so like it can be difficult to do that. Um, so here he shares, and he's even commented out some aspects here, etc., etc. This is trying to be slide code. It's it's just a difficult thing to write perfectly intelligible code while also getting things done. Um, so I don't know if it's feasible to try to read code like that. If there are linters, if there are other tools you can use on your code base to help you understand it better. Again, everything you set up takes time and energy and you have to maintain it afterward. But sometimes these tools do provide benefits. I don't know whether the Go uh, language, the Go library and such that you can download uh, provide excellent tools for sanity checking your code. Uh, I don't think this sort of thing would have been caught by some sort of sanity checking thing because empty string is a string. So like unless somehow Go has a way to d see that, hey, you're about to return empty string from a function and empty string has some quirky concerns um, like wherever it is that empty string is being returned and passed into this um, I don't know returning empty string might set off a warning flag somehow somewhere with some code analysis tool but probably not probably also reading the code wouldn't give you enough information arguably structuring the code slightly differently so that this piece that gets the database from the context, putting that in a separate function, putting this in a separate function, putting segregating your code function by function might make it easier 
in the event that you have uh, this sort of information or this sort of information, you could break things down more granularly than you are already doing. Um, might be able to see more parameter values and such. The database log might give you some idea what's going on, even if other tools don't give you that sort of information, but it might be difficult to access the database tools. I don't know. There's a lot of things you could do. I'm sure there's tons and tons of priorities, and you do the best you can with the resources you're given. It's I can't really... Of these lessons, read the code is a difficult one to swallow. It is... Possible is a fun word to use here. Um, I don't know. Like, it takes a lot of work to find a bug like this solely through reading code. On many occasions, I've been told that, hey, you can read code. And there's a reality that, okay, yes, people can read code, but almost all projects are complex. And while reading code is possible, I don't know that you'd want to send an engineer through reading a code base for one hour or eight hours or 40 hours or 200 hours. At some point, reading code becomes perhaps not the best way to investigate an issue. Even if you're developing code and trying to read your code or read somebody else's code, it can be quite challenging to bear everything in mind that a compiler or other tool might uh, be able to produce in some other kind of summarized way. So uh, not only reading code, but code review can be useful, but it only goes so far. Go tool pprof is super powerful. And this test he did above only scratches the surface of what it can do. He's used it in the past to find specific lines of code where the bulk of time is being spent. That's awesome. So yeah, that's the tool, I believe, which produced the call graph we observed here. And, uh, um, well, perhaps both of these things. The pprof shows, here's in your code base, out of all the CPU cycles that are being spent, here's where it's all being spent. And many modern languages, uh, hopefully, not just Go, not just Java and the JVM, but hopefully many others provide similar capability. Otherwise, you would really struggle to do development without like having to enable debug flags all over your code if the tools you have don't natively give you this sort of capability. You'd have to kind of build your own in cases where you're facing uh, great challenges. Uh, so what else might there be? But yeah, it's a powerful tool. So uh, this is kind of encouraging if I had to pick a language to do a new project in, and it had to be a very highly scalable project. Go might be a good language to do that in. Maybe. Uh, also, yeah, open source free software. If you're interested in open source projects, uh, feel free to get in touch with them, and the Google's Discord server is available here. So this topic of Cesar's blog here was on um, his development journal uh, using the language of Go, often written as Golang, so that so as not to be confused with the board game of Go. Uh, so yeah, thanks, many thanks to Cesar for publishing this analysis. Um, yeah, who would have guessed that you? have to do something like this uh, and like you point out like in many cases he's been able to use tools you didn't have to go to this extreme but um, yeah as it, it becomes difficult to predict what's going to cause this sort of asymptotic behavior unless somehow you can test for it and so yeah when you're writing code in the first place um, like Maybe you do know this, maybe you don't. Maybe it's really hard to ascertain. But um, there's some kinds of database queries that you have to question, how is this going to scale over your time as you're writing it? So 
Um, again, this can be really difficult to predict in advance, especially how is this going to predict as more and more data builds in the database, or is there additional users? How do you predict the scaling of a query? Um, it can be a difficult exercise, particularly if you've not modeled this sort of thing before. Um, but yes, yeah, so here we have a query that's ordered by created at descending. And that might be our hint here that, well, hang on, we have a collection or a database table. And we know, sure, of course, we put an index on the table. And yes, we expect this table to grow over time. And we expect, yes, the records are going to be sorted by created at so we know the ordering of the records, not just having to look at a database sequence or something of that sort, but we can see um, actual, well, we know that this is going to build up over time, and this is how we're going to order the results. And uh, yeah, so we know that this is a growing collection. And then we look at the attributes here. So we're going to look for records that are not none or aborted or canceled because we want to get the game history. So none of these seems to indicate that this is some sort of record. Uh, we're saying not in one of these reasons. We have to expect that most games aren't in one of these states. I mean, yeah, many games might be in this none state for all I know. But you would think there would be another state here called like completed or finished or all the ways the game could be completed, such as a resignation or a win by timeout or other things. Um, so there's all kinds of reasons a game could potentially end. And so you know that like this here is going to find ended games. You even designed the user interface with this in mind, that this collection of games that's in the database is going to expand. You know it is. So this part of the query is not going to do anything to um, uh, limit the result set. Um, there's no limit at the end of this either. Even though there's some the visualization can only support so many different things being displayed. There's not a limit clause because maybe because databases don't have a common way that's easy to do limiting. Maybe that's not the case. Maybe there's some other reason we don't need to limit this here. Maybe there's an implicit limit or a configurable limit some other way. Um, but it wouldn't hurt to verify that if you're going to do something and you know that there could be more and more games over time, Maybe add a limit, um, but you don't expect there to be tons and tons and tons of games, right? So a rematch streak, I think this concept is spawned by the notion that below the game board on Woogles.io, after you've completed a game, there's a button called rematch. And it's stunning to me that's what this is actually referring to, is that some players will play like a one minute game or which is just crazy, and they'll do a series of these games with the same opponent. And this series, they just keep clicking the rematch button between games. You can build up this enormous collection of games that are all related in a particular sequence. And I think that's what rematch ID refers to here. I think it's finally dawning on me that it's related to the rematch button. Not the way that on a different website you can see the history between players that's explicitly defined or that's defined just by all the games they've previously played this seems much more to suggest a rematch series um so yeah this talks about the technical aspect of like yeah this uh, shows x times in a row i don't know if a player plays a series of games and then they take a break play some other opponents, and then come back and play some more games. Is there, like, multiple... Uh, are there multiple rematch streaks, one for each series of games? I assume so, but I don't know. But either way, maybe that's what was being relied on here, is that, like, what sane player would play a rematch streak? In fact, we see here, HastyBot's the opponent. HastyBot's willing to play tons and tons of games in a streak. 
Um, so most players are not going to play dozens and dozens or hundreds of games in the same streak. So arguably, like the value of a limit keyword, you'd expect not to be there. Could not be a lot of value in putting a limit here. So yeah, that'd be a micro optimization, I suppose, and prematurely so to add a limit here. But it would have <laughs> accidentally prevented the issue in the first place. Um, but yeah, there's this expectation that yeah, we know we're gonna get this uh, oh this attribute out of the JSON, and that this O attribute uh, identifies which streak it's a part of. Um, so, I guess two thoughts on that. Um, yeah, it's very, very unfortunate and accidental, and there's nothing you could have done, as far as I know, in the language to prevent an empty streak this empty string from leaking into this function and polluting that. But um, yeah, there still could be some micro-optimization for, well, uh, to support not getting data back in this way. Uh, there could also be another optimization if you think about it. Do we need this attribute called a rematch streak? If games are ordered by the created at time, and you have, oh, maybe this identifies an opponent as opposed to a streak. Or maybe an opponent and a streak have the same identifier. Yes, I guess that's what this is needed for us to identify. I mean, you know the created at time. Um, yeah, you do need to know the opponent in question, don't you? Um but yeah, O here refers to the original request ID of the streak. Um, yeah, I guess there's not a better way to like pare down this query. It would have been nice if somehow, you yeah, know, putting things together by created at date wouldn't have worked here. You actually do, there's no other way to obtain the same results here. Um, but yeah, there's no bound on the created at date, nor is there a limit on the number of records returned. So like, yeah, this is something, this query is just challenging in the first place, even in the case where you do have, uh, like not an empty string fed into this, it still could be of some concern, but probably not as much concern, especially since, uh, we tested. Remember, there was this, this side to run a tournament and have 200 players click the button artificially at the same time uh, up here. So we know from this profiling that there's not a massive issue with this query as it's currently structured. But yeah, this um, would be another micro-optimization to like only search so far back or have some other way of identifying a relation um, because this is searching a game database, right? Arguably there could be an, some sort of index of what's the last time that I played each opponent, and not necessarily a need to go get the entire collection of all the related games, but just get the most recent one, and then check if the game played immediately prior to that, played by the same player, happens to have the same opponent. You could walk through this with a cursor in the database, but that's kind of overkill at some point. Um, but yeah, as it's written here, database indexes can be quite good for relational data. So um, yeah, I guess what I'm a bit stymied about, now the index is actually a good strategy as long as you know that the index is always gonna be there. Um, yeah, that's what an index is for. Uh, what I was thinking about would be a separate index, and you don't need two indexes. You really don't. This is an ID. An ID uniquely identifies a record or collection of records. Um, the collection of records could have this foreign key uh, that uh, 
reference the ID in a different collection. Or in this case, this original request ID might not even be stored in a different table, but it's implied to be in a different table. And anyway, yeah, this identifier is the thing that connects all the records together. There's not a need for another thing. Um, yeah, because scanning an index for an ID should be quite fast. And if it's not, then yeah, I don't know what you do at that point. Um, I guess you try to find something more efficient than an index, and that's kind of hard to do. Or you could index by created at date as well as the ID and only search back so far in the past for such a record if you have just an absolutely immense sparse collection. There could be other indexes that you could benefit from. Uh, but yeah, anyway, uh, I guess the focus of this was twofold. One, to teach you the practical lessons that, you know, test your theories before doing this massive rewrite, deploying something you don't have adequate means of really testing locally. Um, and two, verify your theories. Uh, or I'm sorry, that's still part of point one, is verify your idea. Uh, two, this visualization is an excellent tool. Um, hopefully it wasn't too taxing to produce the visualization. Uh, yeah, because it looks... I don't know that I could completely see everything here. We can try to zoom in on it. And you can see here's 1 a.m., 1 a.m., 1 a.m., and 1 a.m. Here, there's 4, 4, 4, 4. would have been... I don't know if the visualization can somehow combine graphs and stack them together and you could see the CPU first spike. And then after the CPU spike here, at let's say 110. Or no, this is a three hour window here. Yeah, let's say this happened at 120. And over here we have another window and at least this happens at like three with the network bytes. And then over here there's some spikes on the network out around four. Um, so this spike here, how do I line up these spikes? It's really difficult for me. Um, unfortunately, yeah, the, when you're in a hurry like this, you can't get perfect pictures. In an ideal world, you'd be able to like cut this around 10 a.m., 10 a.m., 10 a.m., 10 a.m., and be able to see and widen all these points and line them up on something time-wise. Um, so I'm just trying to see if I, yeah, does this line up with anything here? The CPU's just really high over here. The network is high, network in is high there. And network out at 4 a.m. onward is spiking at arbitrary intervals. One, two, three, four, five intervals. Whereas these seem to be relatively flat with a couple spikes toward the end. But um, yeah, the network out, this has a much different shape than the other two shapes. I'm curious what kind of tests could be conducted to compare shapes with each other and draw inferences from that. But yeah, one of these is not like the others. I mean, there's also all these other panels here that aren't shown. But the status check failed is a flat zero. So, oh, this is the DB prod. So the DB status is always responsive. The database is always there. It might be doing things, but it's responsive. Um, so what takeaways do we have? Oh, that's right. And then we have this other graph here. Oh, is this a stacked graph? Wait, I can't read the caption, unfortunately. Um, yeah, it'd be nice to read this, but I think this is what I was asking for, is a stacked. It's a CPU utilization. This is, I don't know what. Um, CPU reservation? and memory reservation, so how much memory is available in reserve. So all these lots and lots of spikes here, and these things are lining up. 
Um, seemingly not with other things. Um, so yeah, one, check your theories to the extent you can before engaging in a massive rewrite of things if you can somehow, without an enormous cost, ver verify your theory, uh, consider doing that. Um, and to become proficient with the tools that you need to be effective at what you do. And are there other lessons? I mean, sure, there's some... It's difficult for me to assess here. Uh, yeah, but I fully back this. Pay more attention to diagnostics. Again, you can hear many speakers talk about this uh notion of just pay attention to things but if you don't have a compelling visualization of these things it can be difficult to pay attention to them uh oh yeah Th try to run tests on systems that simulate production environments if you're having diff especially if you're having difficulty replicating the production issue um but yeah if you can afford it and you can't always afford it have some, I don't know, have a backup machine or have something that um, you can do reasonable tests on. In an ideal world, you'd be have that access to a copy of the production data, and there could be all kinds of reasons that might not be feasible. But, um, yeah. In a perfect world, you should have been able to replicate this with a 200-player profiling test. Honestly, a 200-player profiling test would have been very much overkill for this kind of issue if you had the production database dump on the test machine. Like, a two-player profiling test might have been enough to replicate these spikes. Um, and... Yeah, just the better quality data you have access to, the better you can do. Um, code reading is quite difficult. Uh, I've beaten a dead horse on that. And this Go tool, yeah, this is great. So this is reinforcing what I was suggesting about, um, or I read this first and I'm repeating this point, that just know your tools, you have access to them, because sometimes you're going to need them. Or... I don't know, maybe just learn things as you need to. Um, if you are if you somehow become the expert who have to solve things, you have to have some ability to figure things out. Or contact folks who can help you. Or, yeah, those are really your options. Either you got it, or folks you know can help you out. Otherwise, failure could happen. Um, there's nothing really mentioned here about how to sufficiently triage an issue until you've locally replicated it. And that can be difficult to do, especially if um, if you're unable to check assumptions, if you can't get the dumps or information required from the production machine before taking features offline. Um, so, yeah, what... Uh, I don't... I'm trying to draw other conclusions here, but everything comes with experience, and yeah, I'm glad to see that Woogles uh, is in the free software ecosphere. Glad to see that um, so many people are enjoying this site. I am more recently enjoying their puzzle mode. I find it quite fun. Um, although, like, some of the puzzles are very challenging, and I'm needing lots of hints to get through them. They are producing a great site, so I appreciate what they're doing. I'm promoting, to what extent I can, uh, the work the Woogles team has produced. So, uh, yeah, thanks to them for producing this as free software under a license that's available. They've, to some extent, helped me uh, get my local instance they've offered me personal assistance getting my local test copy of this site up and running in my linux box connecting to it for my windows machine even though that's not their uh their strongest suit necessarily so i greatly appreciate their help getting that 
I'm still having my own issues. I'll get through those at some point. I'd be glad to contribute more in the future because um, I've not contributed much so far, but um, hopefully, t uh, yeah, it'd be good to see them produce better and better things and uh, do so while also occasionally writing about it or occasionally you can catch uh, live streams by Cesar on occasion. Those are interesting as well. Although, yeah, if a ghost not your thing, it might be challenging to follow, but maybe you'll learn something from it. But yeah, kudos to the entire team for producing such great software, as well as uh, such a great analysis of, like, this... Uh, I think these sorts of analyses uh, encourage people to think about, like, what they had to go through and be able to explain it to other people. And hopefully encourages more people to uh, help uh, this code base uh, to help this project be successful. It's not just about the code. It really isn't. It's having a team that want to produce a quality product that many people can interface with. And so, yeah, if you want to do so, uh, feel free to check out woogles.io or even join their Discord server and just see what they're up to. Um, they're nice folks. Um, yeah, so they have features for puzzle mode. They have a lobby where you can play games. You can play against a computer if you're too nervous about playing against people. And there's a variety of AI opponents that are available. I'm still trying to get my bearings with the whole code base because there's a lot of it. But I think in due time I'll finally get my sea legs and maybe be able to contribute a little better than I've done in the past. So, yeah, many thanks to the team, and best of luck in 2022.